On your journey through life, you are the hero. There are times, however, when it is beneficial to have an advisor to guide you along your path. Welcome to the Smart Money Simplified Podcast with Brent Mikosh, Certified Financial Planner, Certified Investment Management Analyst, and Co-Founder of MP Advisors, LLC. In this podcast, Brent discusses some of the most important and interesting topics of the day as they relate to finance, the economy, and beyond. Now, on to the show. Hello, and welcome to Smart Money Simplified with Brent Mikosh. Brent, how are you? I'm doing great. How are you doing today, Eric? I'm doing fantastic. I'm excited. I know I'm going to learn a lot on the show today. You've got a guest on again, as usual. Who'd you bring on? Well, it's Steve Moore. He's the Vice President for Highland Capital Brokerage. And this is going to be an incredibly exciting topic. And I mean that I'm not being facetious when I say that. We're going to talk about life insurance. Okay. But I think it's definitely a misunderstood asset. I view it as a completely separate asset class and can do a lot of really useful things for a lot of our clients. And I just want to dive into what some of the solutions are that uh, life insurance can solve, some of the problems that life insurance can solve in people's lives. All right. I'm looking forward to hearing it. So I've got Steve here. And I met Steve probably now, what do you think, 10 12 years ago, probably. Yeah, it was quite, yeah. yeah. It's been a little while. Yeah, it's been there, yeah. <laughs> but Steve is the guy that I go to when I have any questions about life insurance. I've got, I've got a pretty good working knowledge about the insurance business, but the knowledge that I have might be equivalent to what Steve has in a small. So he's definitely the guy that I go to when I've got questions about you know, solutions we have for clients, things we want to use life insurance for. Because one of the things I hope we touch on today is, is there's, there's a variety of reasons that people use life insurance. It's not just for pay a premium and get a death benefit. There's a lot of other really cool things that life insurance can can do for for investors. And so we're gonna talk about that today. I think I think a good segue, Steve, would just be to talk about what kind of changes have happened in the insurance business in the last couple of years. Well there's been a couple of significant changes that have happened. Uh, the policies are now getting more uh, specifically designed for either death benefit or cash accumulation. And there's two different markets that we deal in in that. And also the improvement in mortality. We're, we're prior to 2001, we had contracts that only last to age 100. Now we've got contracts that last to age 120, 121 plus, And it allows us to lower the cost of insurance and do a lot more creative things with insurance. Absolutely. I think the one of the things that you talked about is, is cash accumulation versus the death benefit. And correct me if I'm wrong with this, but this is how I've always viewed life insurance. There's a couple ways you can look at it. One way is I got to maximize the death benefit. I've got to put a value on someone's life, meaning they die, we get the maximum payout for the family or whoever the ultimate beneficiary is. In that case, we really want to shop it across multiple carriers and see who's going to be competitive for for the specific clients that we're looking for. Um, And that's fine. And it's important to be competitive in that area. But the other really interesting thing that you can do with these policies is to think about, okay, what if I wanted to reverse that? What if I wanted to take the legally minimum required death benefit per insurance premium? And and we're going to get a little bit wonky here in terms of some of the details in what makes an insurance policy versus an annuity. But I I want to have a minimum death benefit, but I want to accumulate cash value. And the reason I want to do that is because if I can accumulate a lot of cash value inside these policies, I'm getting a tax treatment for that money down the road when I start distributing this money that I really can't beat anywhere outside of a Roth IRA. And might have gotten a little technical with that, so we're going to back that up a little bit. But uh, looking at those two things, which one do you want to touch on first? Looking at that, again, max death benefit or max cash accumulation? Well, let's go with the max, max accumulation. I agree with you, because I think that's the most interesting thing, because death benefit's easy. You solve for the death benefit you want, you find small premium. But in this case, if we really want to accumulate cash, um, let me just put this question to you. Is why would I care about doing that in a life insurance policy? Well, the advantages of a life insurance policy accumulating cash is that you do have the tax-free buildup of cash value, so you don't have to do any annual reporting, and you have the tax-free distributions on the back end. So when we start taking a supplemental retirement income, let's say it's 60, 65, 70, 60, 67, wherever that is, uh, we are able to get that money out just like a Roth IRA on a tax-free basis. And if that's because we design it properly. Right. When you say non-reportable, I think that's, you know, clients are always concerned if they've got an investment. Uh, K1 is a 1099. What, what, what is the document that I've got to report to the IRS for that money? And inside the life insurance policy, the answer is nothing. Am right. I right? There's no reporting whatsoever. The only time there would be reporting is if the policy expired before death. 
Right. So we need to make sure that there's a minimal amount of cash value, which you and I always do. Right. Uh, to make sure that that policy is going to work and distribute the cash value appropriately. Got it. And so what I'm going to do now is, is back out and, and kind of discuss a situation where I think that this works and just what the mechanics are of it. Because everyone's question is always, you know, what can I do, obviously, to grow my money safely, but also do it in a way that's the most tax advantage way possible. And there's no way that I know of that is going to get you around paying taxes. You're either going to pay taxes now or you're going to pay taxes later. And there's obviously, is it particularly for business owners and, and you know, corporate executives, people that are contributing to their 401ks. If you're a business owner, you can set up a pension plan, 401k, all those different things. But and those are only things, and they're great. They're great tools. But what they are is they're they're allowing you to defer income today. But at some point, you get big growth out of that, which is the goal. When you withdraw those assets, the IRS is going to say, "Okay, this is dollars we've never been taxed, and we want to tax you on those." Which is why the Roth has always been so interesting, the Roth IRA, because you're not, for people, just a little bit of a clarity in terms of what they do. It's after-tax dollars that go into a Roth, but you're severely limited in terms of how much, particularly if you're high income earning, the answer is usually zero, but how much money you can actually get into a Roth IRA. But once you get it in there, it's after-tax dollars in there. It grows tax-free. Distributions are tax-free. Passes on to your beneficiaries without, without a tax hit. And so the question for our higher inc- income earning clients or people that have really good cash flow is, can I, is there a way I can kind of create a Roth IRA without any contribution limits? Or a Roth IRA, I like to put, you know, Roth IRA on steroids, just something that, that we can get. It's after tax dollars today, so no benefit to it today, but I can get it in some kind of a platform that's going to grow over a very long period of time and then the distributions are gonna be tax free. So you, you wanna talk a little bit about the mechanics of how that works? Well, w- what we do is we design the policy with the absolute minimum death benefit to minimize the insurance charges inside the policy. And the IRS gives us what that guideline is. It's called the Modified Endowment Guideline, and we, we work within $1 of that figure in our funding. So there's no restriction on funding. Again, we had a policies uh, just this week that we were putting in $10,000 a month into the policies over a seven-year period of time with the idea that we would distribute income at age 67 through age 90 on a tax-free basis. And and for this young couple that we just did this for, it was producing uh, incomes in excess of $400,000 a year. Yeah, it's, it's pretty powerful because because you're looking at that ultimate distribution that you're going to get down the road. The IRS is not taking their piece because they've already taken their piece. They're taking their piece before you've before you've put this money into the contract. Now, Eric, I'm going to roll you into this right now as someone that, that probably is not... Steve and I can get a little bit wonky when we start talking about life insurance. But what we're talking about, does this make sense to you? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I've, I've heard this a little bit before, but I love the discussion. I love you guys getting a deeper dive into it. Yeah, because to me, it's a pretty it's a pretty exciting way to, to again, try to grow this money. Um, and it's something, you know, full disclosure, I don't think RJ will have a problem with, but something I also do personally. Mm-hmm. And so I believe in it as, as an entirely different asset class. And so now the question is, you get it into this policy. So you, you determine you know, how much free cash flow you have, whether it's in, we can do it in one lump sum. So let's mm-hmm. say someone had a sale of business or a large, a, a particularly good year or a lot of money that rolled in the door. We, we don't want this thing to be an annuity. So do you want to just, you want to describe to people that might be listening to this, what is the difference between what we're talking about and an annuity? Well, the difference is that modified endowment guideline figure. If we exceed that amount, meaning if we had lower than a death benefit, lower than that the modified endowment guideline figure, we would have taxation as an annuity, which means we would be get tax deferred growth, but we would have to pay tax on the back end like an annuity does. Right. We do not want that to happen when we do everything to make sure that that doesn't happen in our policy designs. Yeah. And so, and so I think, Steve, what, what you're saying with that is, is you get the growth tax deferred of the assets, but annuities are basically treated for the most part, you know, last in first out. Correct. So, so any of that growth is tax at ordinary income. In that case, in that case, we we've ended up being behind the curve. We got some tax deferral when we tried to grow this thing, but we also didn't get long-term capital gains rates, which are significantly, at least today, significantly lower than uh, the ordinary income tax rates. So we don't want that to happen. And in terms of the history of this thing, and Steve, you can you correct me if I'm wrong on this, but I think back in the '80s, wasn't there a case back in the '80s where, let's say, someone had a million dollars in cash, and they could they could basically put a million dollars into one of these policies and have the death benefit be a million and one dollars and call it a life insurance policy. And now this money basically is protected from taxation 
indefinitely in the future. And the IRS kind of said, hey, wait a second. <laughs> you know, right. What you're doing is not life insurance. Here's, it's something very different, so it's going to be an annuity, uh, which is why now they've got these rules. Was it four or five years that you've got to invest this money in to the policy? It's, it's usually uh, five years minimum, uh, okay. but seven-year guideline is usually the, the figure that we use. It's just, there's, the testing period is over a seven-year period of time. Right. And so <clears throat> if someone's coming in and basically they've got this lump sum of cash, they're ready to do something like this, they can still – basically fund the policy with a single premium. But what happens is the carrier essentially is, is holding it and just making premium payments for them over several years. Essentially what they're doing is putting it into a fixed account and that account over that period of time that we fund it will be generating some taxable income, but we're depleting that account, let's say over a five year period of time or a seven year period of time. But you know, typically they'll, well, they'll allow us to put it into like a three and a half percent fixed account and deplete it down over that period of time. So we do not violate those guidelines and make sure it's tax free. Got it. Got it. And now in terms of the other cool thing I think about, you know, having cash value inside of a life insurance policy that people should probably think of more is you can't take it. It's creditor protected. Correct. And, and that is a pretty big one because I know that when I think of the things, um, if you look at the things basically for any business owner that might blow them up financially, everyone's concerned about what stocks and bonds are doing and what the financial market's doing. Everyone that comes in talking, speaks to me, is concerned about that. And we're in a year already in 2022. It's been pretty interesting, to say the least. You've got the Fed, you've got you've got Russia and Ukraine, you've got all kinds of things happening. Inflation now has kind of reared its head again after a really long period of time. And it's been a rocky ride for the markets. And that is usually what concerns people, but they don't realize and they may not they may not really assess look they may not be able to realize the main risk is not so much whether stocks are up and down in any given period of time it's what taxes will do over them over the long term we've talked a little bit about that but the other piece is what happens if they're sued what what assets are takeable in the in the state of Arizona in 2004 they came out with a law that protects the cash value buildup inside of a life insurance policy from being subject to claims of creditors Okay. So as after a two year period of ownership, not, not two years of your funding period, two years from the date you take get approved for the application and fund the application, it, that's when your two years start. So you can have a seven year funding program and after the first two years, you are fully creditor protected with all assets that you put into that policy from that point forward. So basically if someone is in a situation where they think they may be having a legal problem a year down the road, this is not the right thing to do. <laughs> you don't, you're, you're not, you can't, you can't be funding one of these to, to, to avoid an existing legal problem. But a policy like this gets funded three, four years down the road, something occurs as a car accident or slip and fall or the business or whatever might happen. Now you've actually got some additional protection. That's correct. They, right. they cannot force you to, to distribute money out of your policy to satisfy a claim. Okay. Now, and a story that I once heard, and I don't know if this is the case because we've never actually discussed this, but I, but obviously we know OJ Simpson <laughs> in terms of what happened there. When he basically was found guilty in that civil case, they were never able to get his NFL pension. Correct. And is that is that because it, it follows those same insurance guidelines where that pension was not takeable in a civil event like that? That's correct. Well, the pensions were or protected from... A pension was anyway. Right. Okay. Yeah, and, of course. Then, and then he moved to Florida, yeah. which gave him another layer of protection so they couldn't take his, his real estate. Okay. I heard the same thing actually about the Enron guys as well. Is that accurate? That, I think so. Yeah. I, I, I'm not as familiar with that one. I'd heard the number of those had, had overfunded and, and again, not trying to... to um, say anything good about the guys from Enron, but but I did, I once read that they had pretty large cash value and in life insurance policies. And despite everything that happened for Enron, they actually got out of jail and they still had some money, which is um, which shows you, particularly in high profile cases like the two of those, how, how powerful that asset protection can be. Correct. So, so let's say we fund one of these things and we decide that we're, we're gonna create this super Roth or Roth IRA on steroids. What do we invest it in? Well, the, the products that we have now are what they call indexed uh, universal life. So usually it's tied into the S&P 500. And what they're doing is look, allowing you to invest in a, an option that basically looks back at one year to see if the market's been up. If the market's been up, we're going to participate in the growth of, the, of, the, of that uh, deposit. So example, what happens is we limit you on the upside 
We're not going to give you the full S and P 500 growth on that period, of, that over that period of time, over that one year. But we are going to cap it. At, let's say it's at 10 percent. And on the downside, if the market goes down 20 or 30 percent, we're going to cap you on the downside. It'll be zero percent. So we try to operate between that zero and 10 percent figure with these types of products and uh, not participate in any negative markets going forward. So to give you an example, if let's say we have um, you had a client that wanted to do $100,000 a year for five years or something like that, $100,000 goes in, we, we are basically now in, a, in, a, in an indexed universal life policy. S&P, bad timing. The S&P is down 18% that year. Basically, their cash value does not decrease. The insurance costs still remain, obviously. So you're going to have to pay for that mortality because there is a death benefit associated with these. Correct. But you're not going to experience a market loss. No, you will not participate in any negative market performance whatsoever. Year two, we've got uh, we we put in the next hundred thousand dollars. The market goes up eighteen percent, and let's say the cap is seven or eight percent, just to make to make the number pretty easy. They've experienced now a hundred percent of that market gain up into that cap, up to that seven or eight percent. So basically what you're doing is you're cutting off the extremes in terms of the market performance Correct. on either side. Correct. Okay. So there won't be the, you, you know, I, I think of, of market cycles where, um, aside from the, obviously the credit protection and the tax deferral market cycles, where this may not have been the best solution, probably, probably have been something like the late nineties where you had five successive years where the S and P 500 was up greater than 20%. Yeah, but there's a way of counteracting that even because we typically wouldn't put in a lump sum into the market, oh, that 100000 for example. Right. We would probably dollar cost average that in. Okay. So every time we look back, it's over a 12-month period. So if January to January, February to February, March to March, and when we look back, if any one of those segments is up, we participate in the up market. Okay. And during that period of time, there was several several months, one-year look back periods during those periods of time was. where the market was yeah. up. It's true. You had you had the emerging market crisis. You had long term capital crashing out. You had a lot of, despite the fact every year the market was up pretty much for the late nineties, you had some some pretty good fifteen to twenty percent pullbacks during that run. Right. I remember that pretty well for sure. So that premium payment then is getting, like you said, it's getting dollar cost, and you're not getting the the only price you're getting is not the day of of the premium payment, for example. That's usually not the way we we like to see it done, just because we want to hit a lot of market segments and see because we don't know when the mar positive markets are going to be in the negative right. markets, we've got a better chance of getting that period by dollar cost averaging in. Let's say you wanted to build a, a, a portfolio, at least um, you wanted to tie this, the cash value of the life insurance policy is something more than the S and P 500. Do you have the option to do say 70% with the S and P and 30% with the EFI, which would be the developed international equities, for example. Yes. There's various different indexes and in, in these different products that we have available to us. And actually what we're finding is a lot of the two year and three year buckets where they take, take a look back at, let's say the S and P 500 over a two year period of time have substantially better performance than a lot of the one year performance okay. contracts. Okay, cool. So again, this is it's a it's a strategy that um, that I believe in pretty strongly. I think that uh, it, I view this as an entirely separate asset class than anything that you're doing. Whether it's you know you're buying stocks, bonds, you're holding cash, investing in real estate through some of the financial instruments. I view this as being almost a completely separate strategy. Away from this, we'll call it the super Roth or something like that. First of all, tell tell me who is the ideal client for the ideal person should be looking at this as a strategy. And then I do want to go on and touch on a couple of other issues around life insurance. Ideally, it's somebody who has at least 10 years before they want to tap into the retirement income. Yeah. Actually bring up a great point that we probably should have discussed is you're, you're, you know, everything, every investment, and this is how I view every single investment. You've got a, a really nice shiny side of the coin that looks fantastic. You turn it over and there's something that's, that's not as attractive. In this case, what I've always thought of in the negatives of it or the drawbacks are, when you're in these policies, you are in these policies. This is not something that you get in and out of. You're basically committing for a decade or more of, of investing in of investing in these policies and letting this really cook for a long period of time. That's correct. Yeah, and and the um, the other uh, downside on that is that or there, there's actually not a downside. It's actually you can we can design it to take retirement income. It doesn't have to be a retirement age. We could actually take retirement income out of these policies at 
a younger age than 59 and a half. That's a good point. So there's no penalty on taking the money. We could take it at 55. So if we had a 35 year old that funded it to 45 years of age and then just let it cook to 55 before they started taking the retirement income, we could do that. Right, because you're not subject to that 59 and a half rule. Correct. Right, right. And the other thing I think that if I was, um, if I was an accountant or something that was that was listening uh, in on this is, you know, obviously you want to keep these policies alive. You don't want any surprises. And and if you're going to be drawing down the cash, at some point if the policy collapses, then all of those gains become taxable. That's correct. Right. So it's so it's important to do this right <laughs> and to make sure that you don't lapse these policies. So how do we do that? Well, all these uh, carriers have now built in what they call an overloan protection rider into these contracts. So once we have a cash value that's, uh, or a, a loan value that's approximately 90 to 95% of the value in the policy, we have the option of going to the company and saying, we'd like to exercise our overloan protection rider, which basically puts the contract in uh, what you, uh, for better terms, uh, a paid up status, meaning that there won't be any more premiums allowed into it. There won't be any more distributions of income, but the contract has a death benefit that will be paid at some point in the future. So that all that retirement income you've received up to that point will not be subject to an income tax all at once. Right. So you're basically making it impossible to collapse the policy. Correct. Okay. Got it. Got it. And the last point I'll make with these as well is, you know, the question with any insurance product is, is cost. And uh, and particularly with life insurance, you know, the main component of the cost of life insurance is the mortality charge. You know, the carrier looks at me and says, okay, here's Brent, he's 48 years old in Arizona, good health. This is the likelihood that he dies within this set period of time, and they assign a premium payment based on that. So there's always a mortality charge. The cool thing that I've found with these is because you're looking at getting that minimum death benefit particularly once you get five, six, seven years in this thing where you have all the, pre- the the payments that have gone in to fund this policy, the cash value begins to build. If they perform as they should, particularly when you have that, that protection on the downside, the internal cost of these, once they're fully funded, you're talking maybe a percent and a half or two in terms of mortality charges. Is, is that a pretty accurate number? That, that is accurate. What, what they're doing is they're, they're charging you on the difference between the death benefit and the cash value. Right. And since there's a lot of cash value being built up and there's very little death benefit in the policy, the, the, the cost starts to going down per, per thousand as, as the, the cash, cash gets bigger. Correct. Because the more cash, the more you're basically self-insured. And so the carrier is off the hook with that. Correct. Okay, cool. Yeah. Uh, another thing I want to talk about a little bit today, and that's main point was this, because I just think it is such a cool strategy from both the tax standpoint and also a, a credit protection standpoint. And also, again, being in these markets that we've been in so far this year, a ton of volatility, you're stripping all that risk and volatility out of, out of, uh, out of an investment class. But life insurance is an area that if I bring it up to clients, they usually kind of roll their eyes <laughs> and, and don't want to talk about it. everybody. It's, it's, it's not, it might be second to dental work in terms of what people really want to spend their time diving into. But I think it's a, it's a really important area because I view insurance of all kinds. If, if it would kill you to write the check or financially destroy you, you've got to insure it. And that's, you know, it's your house, it's your car. It's also someone's life in terms of something happening with that. A lot of bad things that I've seen occur in life insurance policies in the past is because people haven't been paying attention to them. They miss a premium payment. The illustrations they might have originally been sold these policies under no longer exist because they weren't looking at the guaranteed rates. They were looking at the expected returns, which can be very two very different things. And so real quick, as we sort of as we wrap here a little bit, can you give me a couple a couple things that everyone should be thinking of in terms of maintaining and uh, looking at existing policies that may ha- that they may have out there? Well, ideally, if there's any policies written before 2000, those are on the uh, old mortality table that, that valued policies only to age 100. So the cost of insurance was much higher in those contracts. Mm-hmm. Definitely worth a review to, to, to look at those contracts. Also, uh, one of the newest twists in, in these life insurance policies now is the ability to use the death benefit for long-term care needs. Right. And these p- old policies that we have that, that, that p- basically were... F- fit for or set up basically for family protection or maybe are no longer needed for family protection. Now we could take a look at look moving those policies into a life insurance policy with the long-term care benefit so they can actually get access to the death benefit during their lifetime for long-term care needs. 
Yeah, and that that's a great point. I'm glad you brought that up because if you think of standalone life ins- or long-term care policies, rather, it's a really tough one right now. Mm-hmm. Um, without getting into too much detail, I mean, look at what happened with Genworth this year. You know, huge long-term care provider. They're in financial problems. Most of the old long-term care policies that were written, the carriers radically underestimated what this thing was really going to cost. That's correct. Um, so it's a tough space if you want to get a pure long-term care policy right now. But with life insurance, the question is, all right, if you die, somebody's going to get something, ultimately the beneficiaries. But what happens if you need that money ahead of time? And and the benefit of having a long-term care rider on an existing life insurance policy is tremendous because let's say there's a million dollars of death benefit. If you could access some of that death benefit prior to actually the, the, the death of the, insurance, the policy holder, that's a pretty powerful thing. Could you give, it, give us a quick idea in terms of how that works? You, uh, usually, give, I'll give you an example. We have a five hundred thousand dollar death benefit in place on a on a fifty uh, five year old individual, and and they've got they paid up the policy, or we transferred it from an old policy to a new policy, and we've got uh, the person's now sixty seven years of age, and for some reason they need it to go on long term care claim. They'll have access to the death benefit at the, at a set figure. It'll either be two percent of the face amount up to 4% of the face amount. So two, let's say, take an example. 2% of the face amount would be $10,000 per month would be allowed to be distributed as an advance on the death benefit for long-term care needs. Now, to satisfy qualifying for long-term care, you have to satisfy two of the six assisted daily living activities, which are eating, bathing, dressing, toileting, walking, and continence. If you, a doctor says you need help or a uh, licensed practitioner says you need help with two of the six you qualify to go on claim and then then we look at it there's some policies that pay out as a reimbursement policy meaning they ask you as actually ask you will actually reimburse your expenses that you have for long-term care or there's an indemnity contract that'll actually just send you the check to your checking account each and every month you can spend the money as you wish all right and indemnities we both would agree is better a little bit more flexible. Yes. <clears throat> yeah. And I think, and that's something I think is pretty powerful because if you look at, particularly for some of these older policies, and you know, Steve has mentioned a couple of times the actuary tables are saying the insurance companies once said you're going to die by age 100, now they say age 120. And what that really means is a longer life expectancy for the carriers means it's a lot, in their mind anyway, it's longer until they have to pay that benefit. So the so premium payments are less, or it needs to have less cash value. And I know where we've had success looking at some of these older policies in the past is really one of two ways. You've accumulated good cash value, now we're looking under, under the new tables, and we can either basically transfer these into new policies that have much higher death benefit if that's what the family needs. We could potentially transfer these into policies that have a long-term care benefit. So if uh, something happens, the family's assets are not hit hard and depleted if one member of the family gets sick, which I think is a pretty powerful thing. And the third is we've had success even looking at some of these overfunded policies where the life insurance just isn't necessary anymore and use this Roth concept, basically, where we've transferred the cash value into one of these you know, uh, universal life policies that 10 years down the road, we can even less than that, you know, a couple years down the road, depending on how much cash value we have in these policies, you can turn it on and then begin to receive that tax-free income. So if you've got, say, some clients that have, they're entering into retirement, and they had cash value life insurance in place for years and years and years, and they paid into it for years and years and years because they wanted to make sure the kids were taken care of or go to college or the mortgage we paid. And now all those things are done. And so you've got this cash. So what are you going to do with it? The answer is you can protect one spouse for sure if you get that long-term care benefit. The other is you can convert it into something that gives you income today that you can go out and spend that money on and do some things that you want to do. Absolutely. So cool. Well, I appreciate you coming in and talking about this. I it, it, I, I love chatting about, about life insurance with clients. Again, sometimes they roll their eyes at me. I'm not going to lie. But I think it's, it's, such a unique, it's such a unique area, and it's an asset class that I think is – is overlooked in terms of the things that it can do aside from just paying someone a check if someone dies. There's a lot of really cool things in terms of the way that the cash inside that policy is treated that I think makes it worth worth a look for sure for either new policies, new solutions, or if there's older policies out there, what, what's the best thing we can do to maximize the benefit of these? Any parting thoughts and comments? I'm glad you came in here and sat, sat down and talked to me about this. Well, I- as Brent, you, you and I have worked together for a number of years. Design and implementation of advanced life insurance strategies are always on the forefront of, of our planning. So uh, 
I look forward to continuing to work with you and, and finding opportunities to, to add value. And that's an area too, I think that I really want to touch on in terms of, of working with you over the years, Steve, is, is that there's life insurance can be intimidating. It can be boring. It can be a lot of things to people and uh, a lot of people, and they may not be coming in with, 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 super with a really excited attitude about talking about life insurance but this is something where you and i have worked together closely with with clients in their existing legal counsel to design some of these things and um, when you see what you can do to really make these policies add so many different benefits to people's lives i think it's really powerful but you mentioned you mentioned design implementation nobody does that better than you and your team I mean, and that, which is why you, you, I will always include you in, in meetings with clients because I can just hand the ball over to you and let you talk about this stuff. But thanks so much for, for coming in and, and talking about this. And uh, to anyone listening, if you've got old existing policies out there you want to have a look at, if you, if you want to talk about this idea of, again, creating this, this tax-free income later on in life by, by creating a, a Roth with no contribution limits today, um, this is this is definitely a conversation I would love to have with you. And if you've listened to us for this long, I appreciate it. Steve, this has been fantastic. Thank you so much for being on the show. I learned a ton, and I, I will probably speak for most of the people in the audience. I'm really glad this has a pause and a rewind uh, because there's just so much to take in that we uh, I'm going to need to go back and listen to this again. Brent, I know that you're open to these conversations. You even said it yourself. But for those that are maybe new to the podcast, can you give uh, the best contact information so people can reach out and get a hold of you? Absolutely. Um, number for us here at the office is 602-255-0555, or email address is just brent.mikosh, M-E-K-O-S-H, at RaymondJames.com. Uh, if you call our office, we can, we can absolutely get an appointment set to speak. Steve is with Highland Capital Brokerage. They're one of the top five insurance brokerage firms in the country. And Raymond James and Highland have a phenomenal working relationship together. And so he's, he's an outside uh, expert that I bring in on cases like this. Fantastic. Again, Steve, thank you so much for being here. And of course, Brent, thank you for bringing him on the show. And our last thank you is for you, the listening audience. Thank you so much for tuning in and listening to the Smart Money Simplified Podcast with Brent Mikosh. If you have not subscribed to the podcast yet, please click the subscribe now button below. This way, when Brent comes out with a new podcast, it'll show up directly on your listening device. This makes it really easy to share these podcasts with your friends and family. Again, thank you so much for listening today. For everyone at MP Advisors, this is Eric Johnson reminding you to live your best day every day. And we'll see you next time. Thank you for listening to this episode of Smart Money Simplified Podcast. Have any questions about topics covered during the show? Visit www.smartmoneysimplified.com or give us a call at 602-255-0555. Don't forget to click the follow button below to be notified when new episodes become available. The information covered and posted represents the views and opinions of the hosts and or guests and does not necessarily represent the views or opinions of Raymond James Financial Services Incorporated. The content has been made available for informational and educational purposes only. The content is not intended to be a substitute for professional financial advice. Always seek the advice of your financial advisor or other qualified financial service providers with any questions you may have regarding your individual situation. Securities are offered through Raymond James Financial Services Incorporated, member FINRA, and SIPC. Investment advisory services offered through Raymond James Financial Services Advisors Incorporated, MP Advisors, LLC, is not a broker slash dealer and is independent of Raymond James Financial Services.